Politics. This is Democracy Now!, The Quarantine Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As you continue to remember civil rights icon, 17-term Democratic Congress member John Lewis, who died Friday at the age of 80 of pancreatic cancer. He appeared on Democracy Now! in 2012. Talk about taking part in the Freedom Rides. On May 9, 1961, my seatmate, a young white gentleman, we arrived at the Greyhound bus station in Rock Hill, South Carolina. We got off the bus. What were you doing there? We were testing the facilities. The lunch counters, the waiting room, the restroom facility. During those days, the station was more white waiting, colored waiting, white men, colored men, white women, colored women. And we were following a decision of the United States Supreme Court, ban and discrimination of segregation and intrastate travel. And when we started to enter the so-called white waiting room, we were attacked by a group of young white men, beaten and left in a pool of blood. The local police officials came up and wanted to know whether we wanted to press charges. We said, no, we believe in peace, we believe in love and nonviolence. Years later, to be exact, 48 years later, Mr. Wilson and his son came to my office in Washington and said, Mr. Lewis, I'm one of the people that beat you. Will you forgive me? I apologize. His son had been encouraging his father to do this. His son started crying. Mr. Wilson started crying. He hugged me. His son hugged me. I hugged them both back. And all three of us stood there crying. Um, that's what the movement was about, to be reconciled. When we hear about voting rights today, we don't hear about these struggles that you and so many others that you led went through 50 years ago. That's why it is so important for people to understand, to know that people suffered, struggled, some people bled and some died for the right to participate. You know, the, the vote is the most powerful, nonviolent tool that we have in a democratic society. It's precious, it's almost sacred. We have to use it. If not, we will lose it. A few years after that, two years after, you had your head slammed in and so many others were beaten in Montgomery, um, was the 1963 March on Washington. Dr. King spoke, and you also spoke. I want to go to a clip of that moment. Those who have said be patient and wait, we must say that we cannot be patient. We do not want our freedom gradually, but we want to be free now. We are tired. We are tired of being beaten by policemen. We are tired of seeing our people locked up in jail over and over again. And then you holler, be patient. How long can we be patient? We want our freedom, and we want it now. We do not want to go to jail, but we will go to jail. If this, this is the price, we must pay for love, brotherhood, and true peace. I appeal to all of you to get in this great revolution that is sweeping this nation. Get in and stay in the streets of every city, every village and hamlet of this nation until true freedom comes, until the revolution of 1776 is complete. We must get in this revolution and complete the revolution. For in the Delta of Mississippi, in Southwest Georgia, in the Black Belt of Alabama, in Harlem, in Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, and all over this nation, the black masses are on the march for jobs and freedom. The 
We're talking about slow down and stop. We will not stop. All of the forces of Eastland, Barnett, Wallace, and Thurman will not stop this revolution. If we do not get meaningful legislation out of this Congress, the time will come when we will not confine our march into Washington. We will march through the South, through the streets of Jackson, through the streets of Danville, through the streets of Cambridge, through the streets of Birmingham. But we will march with the spirit of love and with the spirit of dignity that we have shown here today. By the forces of our demand, our determination, and our numbers, we shall splinter the segregated South into a thousand pieces and put them together in the image of God and democracy. We must say, wake up, America, wake up, for we cannot stop, and we will not and cannot be patient. That remarkable speech that you gave on August 28, 1963, you were the youngest speaker at the March on Washington. You spoke before Dr. King. I, I spoke uh, number six. Dr. King was the last speaker. He spoke number 10. Um, that day, when A. Philip Randolph introduced me and he said, and I present to you, young John Lewis, national chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I looked to my right. I saw many of the young people sort of cheering me on. I looked to my left, and I saw young people up in the trees trying to get a better view of the crowd. Then I looked straight ahead, and I said to myself, this is it. I must do my best, and that's what I tried to do. When I was working on the speech, I was reading a copy of the New York Times, and I saw a group of black women in Southern Africa carrying signs saying, one man, one vote. So in my March on Washington speech, I said, one man, one vote is the African cry. It is ours, too. It must be ours. And that became the rallying cry for many of the young people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And yet you had to change that speech that you gave on that day. I was asked to change the speech. Some people thought the speech was too radical, uh, too militant. Uh, I thought it was uh, a speech for the occasion. It represented the people that we were working with. Some people didn't like the use of the word revolution or the use of the phrase black masses. A. Philip Randolph came to my rescue and said, there's not anything wrong with the use of revolution. I use it myself sometime. Uh, it's not anything with black masses. So we kept that part in the speech. But near the end of the speech, I said something like, if we do not see meaningful progress here today, the day may come when we will be forced to march to the South the way Sherman did, nonviolently. And people thought we can make a reference to Sherman. And so we deleted that. I'd like to play Danny Glover reading the excerpts of the speech that you didn't give. To those who have said, be patient and wait, we must say that patience is a dirty and nasty word. Mm -hmm. We cannot be patient. We do not want to be free gradually. We want our freedom and we want it now. <laughs> We cannot depend on any political party, for both the Democrats and the Republicans have betrayed the basic principles of the Declaration of Independence. We won't stop now. All the forces of Eastland, Barnett, Wallace, and Thurman won't stop the revolution. The time will come when we will not confine our marching to Washington. We will march through the South, through the heart of Dixie, the way Sherman did. We shall pursue our own scorched earth policy and burn Jim Crow to the ground. Uh, John Lewis, you also said a part that didn't get included um, was, in good conscience, we cannot support the administration's civil rights bill, for it's too little, too late. There's not one thing in the bill that will protect our people from police brutality. I thought 
and, and I believe that the proposed civil rights bill was not enough. President Kennedy took the position that if a person had a sixth grade education, that person should be considered literate and should be able to register to vote. Those of us in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee took the position that the only qualification for being able to register to vote in America should be that of age and residency, nothing more or anything less. We wanted a much stronger bill, but the whole idea of the march was not to support a particular piece of legislation. It was a march for jobs and freedom. It was a coalition of conscience to say to the Congress and said to the President of the United States, you must act. We didn't think that the proposed bill was commensurate to all of the suffering, to the beatings, to the jailing, to the killing that had occurred in the South. Just before Malcolm X was assassinated, John Lewis met with him in Africa. They spent several days together. I asked John Lewis where they met, what they talked about. We uh, met Malcolm in Nairobi, Kenya, at the New Stanley Hotel. He happened to be staying there. Or we didn't know he was staying there, and we were also staying there. We were on our way to Zambia for an independence celebration. And we had an opportunity to talk and chat with him about what was going on uh, in America. And I think at that time, Malcolm was seeking to find a way to uh, identify with the Southern Civil Rights Movement. He um, wanted to be helpful, wanted to be supportive. And as a matter of fact, he came to Selma. He came to Selma. February the 14th, 1965, and we were in jail, including Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., and the local authority refused to let him come and meet with us. He spoke at the Brown Chapel AME Church with Mrs. King to a group of high school students, and seven days later, he was assassinated. On February 21st, 1965, he was gunned down. I would never forget it, because February 21st is my birthday. And I was in a car on my way from southwest Georgia. You were 25 years old? 25. And I was going from southwest Georgia through Atlanta back to Selma when we heard that he had been shot. I came to New York, attended the service for him. What is your assessment of the significance of Malcolm X? I think Malcolm played a major role in helping to educate, inform, and dramatize the need for mass movement. People read about him. Many of the young people, black and white, read his story. Many did not agree necessarily with his techniques or his tactics. But if Malcolm had lived, I am convinced that he would have been part of the Southern nonviolent wane of the Civil Rights Movement. In his relationship with Dr. King, what did Dr. King think? Uh, I remember Malcolm being in the hotel before we even saw him in, in, in Kenya, the night of the March on Washington. The, the, the evening before the March on Washington, he was at the Hilton Hotel in, in Washington. Now, he didn't like the way the march turned out, because he said it was like a picnic, uh, and that it was not strong enough. And he wasn't invited to speak. He was not invited to speak. We, I didn't have anything to do with that decision. After the Civil Rights and the Voting Rights Act were signed, Dr. King increasingly started speaking out against the Vietnam War. Um, his inner circle saying, don't give that speech at Riverside Church, April 4, 1967, a year to the day before he was assassinated in Memphis, uh, the why I oppose the war in Vietnam speech. You've got the president of the United States behind you. You got him to sign the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act, they said to Dr. King. Um, don't take him on in a war that is not ours. Yet he defied them and said it is. 
Were you a part of that circle? What position did you take, John Lewis? I supported the position of Martin Luther King, Jr. as chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. During that time, we had already taken a position against the war in Vietnam. So many other young people in SNCC, so many other young people that we were working with all across the South were being drafted and going off to Vietnam. So we came out against the war in January 1966. But I was there at Riverside Church on the night of April 4th, 1967, when you spoke. And I think that speech is one of the greatest speeches. A lot of people speak about the march on Washington. It was a wonderful speech. But the speech against the war in Vietnam, Dr. King, he said, I'm not going to segregate my conscience from against violence at home. I'm against violence abroad. And he went on to say that America was the greatest purveyor of violence in the world. He was, he was a preacher. He was a prophet. Do you agree with him? I agree with him. That the U.S. is the greatest purveyor of violence? We have more. We spend hundreds and thousands, millions and billions of dollars on weaponry. We supply in the world. We sell arms to everybody. Dr. King was saying that we have to put an end to this madness. He was influenced by, by Gandhi. And Gandhi said it's nonviolence or non-existence. Dr. King went on to say we must learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish as foes. He was saying, in effect, that we have enough bombs and missiles and guns to destroy the planet. He said it then, and it's still true today. And so today, the war in Afghanistan, the drone war that President Obama is conducting in Pakistan and Yemen and other places with the uh, kill list um, that uh, The Times called it, that he personally keeps and names the people he puts on the list. Your thoughts? Well, I think it's time for us to end in the efforts in Afghanistan. Um, we cannot justify the killing of people that we don't see, we don't know anything about them, or very little. War is not the answer. War is obsolete. It cannot be used as a tool of our foreign policy. It's barbaric. Some place, somehow, people must come to that point and say, I ain't going to stay the war no more. Have you talked to President Obama about this? I have not had an opportunity, but I've spoken out on the floor of the House against the war in Afghanistan, as I did against the war in Iraq. You voted in three days after September 11, 2001, to give President Bush the authority to retaliate in a vote that was 420 to 1. You have described it as one of your toughest votes. Talk about how you decided to do that. I was very disturbed about what happened on 9-11. And when I look back on it, if I had to do it all over again, I would have voted with Barbara Lee. It was raw courage on her part. So because of that, I don't vote for funding for war. I vote against preparation for the military. I would never again go down that road. And what do you say to those who say, then, you're not supporting the military? You're not supporting the soldiers? I support the, the soldier, but I see um, young men in uniform. I say, thank you for your service. And I tell them, I want you, all of you to come home. I tell them to their face. I see them in the airports. I see them in Washington. I say, it's time for you to come home. How did you decide to go from activist, real street-fighting activist, 
you yourself weren't physically fighting, but you were being fought by the police every step of the way, to a Congress member. Talk about the moment you made that decision and the year you did. How old were you? I, I made the decision after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and Robert Kennedy. I was with Robert Kennedy in Indianapolis, Indiana, on the evening of April 4, 1968, when I heard that Dr. King had been shot. I didn't know his condition until Robert Kennedy spoke at a rally that I was having to organize and say that Dr. King had been assassinated. I want to go to that clip. I have some very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight in Memphis, Tennessee. That was Robert Kennedy in Indianapolis, breaking the news to so many. John Lewis, you were there. I, I cried with so many other people, and I said to myself, we still have Bobby. I went back to Atlanta, attended the funeral with Robert Kennedy and hundreds and thousands of others. And after the funeral was over, I got back in the Kennedy campaign, went to Oregon and later to California. The campaign for Bobby Kennedy with Cesar Chavez. It was a wonderful effort. We went all over Los Angeles, going into wealthy neighborhoods, knocking on doors urging people to vote for Bobby. And that evening, the primary was over. Bobby Kennedy came up to me and said, John, I'm going downstairs to make my victory statement. Why don't you remain? I was in his suite with his sister, several other individuals, the brother of Meg Evers. And we listened to Bobby and he said, I went to Chicago, and moments, minutes later, it was announced that he had been shot, dropped to the floor, and cried and cried. I just wanted to get out of L.A. I got on a flight the next morning, flew to Atlanta, and I think I cried all the way from L.A. to Atlanta. And I came back to New York for the funeral. And before the funeral, I stood the night before as an honor guard with Reverend Ralph Abernathy. Then I rode the funeral train. The family asked me to ride with them from New York to Washington. And some place along the way, I felt that somehow, in some way, I had to try to pick up where Dr. King and Robert Kennedy left off. These were my friends. These were my heroes. These were two young men that had inspired me. And some of my friends started encouraging me to get involved in electoral politics, do more than just register people that I should run for office. And I made a decision years later to do it. Finally, at the end of Across That Bridge, your new book, um, you write, just as Gandhi made it easier for King, and King made it easier for Poland, and Poland for Ireland, Ireland for Serbia, Serbia made it easier for the Arab Spring, the Arab Spring made it easier for Wisconsin, made it easier for Occupy. Talk about these connections. I believe there is something in human history. I call it the spirit of history. It's like a spring, a stream that continue to move. And individuals and forces come along to become symbols of what is good, what is right, and what is fair. And that's why I wrote this little book to say to people that you too can allow yourself to be used by the spirit of history. Just find a way to get in the way. When I was growing up, my mother and father, my grandparents and great-grandparents would always tell me, don't get in trouble 
don't get in the way. But I was inspired by Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks and others to get in the way, to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble. And we all must find a way to have the courage to get in trouble, to do our part. Every generation must find a way to lead the planet, lead this little spaceship, Earth, this little piece of real estate a little better than we found it, a little cleaner, a little greener, and a little more peaceful. I think that's our calling. We have a mission, a mandate, and a moral obligation to do just that. Congressmember John Lewis speaking on Democracy Now! in 2012. He died Friday at the age of 80. To see the whole interview, go to democracynow.org. When we come back, we remember another civil rights icon, C.T. Vivian, who also died Friday.